Hi, everyone, and welcome to 30 Minutes on Wins with God's Precious One. This is Bishop M. Precious Fox with Life Impact Church International, joining you for our weekly online Bible study series from 6.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So where are we this week? Well, first thing we want to... to reflect, um, to separate ourselves, to meditate, um, to draw closer unto God in recognition for the sacrifice that he made for us in dying on the cross. We know that uh, 40 days fasting um, has a, a lot of a symbolic meaning, but for many of us, we use this as a time to separate ourselves, to really hear what is God's divine will for our lives, and to really um, commemorate and remember the cross and the suffering uh, that Jesus endured for us, for our sin. God. So it is Wednesday, February the 26th of 2020, and we are continuing. I am, which is Jesus the Christ. So for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, outline. The purpose of this particular lesson was to redirect. It's a redirecting type of series. We wanted to redirect our attention or our focus uh, to the source. Um, too much attention has been given to things like the contact object, and, which in this instance, if we were just looking at our topic, um, the him and the him, um, we think about the story of the woman with the issue of the blood. And a lot of times people put a lot of focus on the him itself. Things like bless oil would be considered a contact object. Um, holy water, those types of things um, would be what we are considering to be contact objects. And even if it's not a contact object that we're putting all the focus on, we start to put our focus on things like the individuals, an individual like our pastor, our chief overseer, our bishops, you know, individuals with titles, um, individual prophets, apostles, those whom we have deemed to be anointed. Uh, we put so much attention on the individual or the contact object that um, we forget who the source is and where that anointing comes from, where that healing comes from, where that miracle comes from. And the purpose of this lesson is to redirect our attention back to the source. Let's, let's get back to what's important. So of course, anytime uh, God begins to deal with me, I always ask questions like, okay, so uh, what's really going on here? What is it that you want me to share with your people or to study with your people, what is it? And um, he shared with me this problem. And the problem with us today, and I always include myself when I say us, is that we're caught up sometimes with, so caught up sometimes with the point of contact or the object. Things like holy water, anointing oil, prayer cloths, crosses, whatever. You know, you have people who won't pray without kissing their cross first. So you have dollars to buy anointed oil and holy water. When Jesus died, he tore the veil so that there did not have to be a third party contact. Nothing had to be in between um, you getting your miracle, your healing, your deliverance from God because Jesus paid to be that intercessor. 
and he is that intercessor for us today. But we have become so dependent on individuals. You know, you don't think you can be healed if your pastor or your chief overseer or someone affluent doesn't come and lay hands on you, or you think you need um, the object of contact, the hem of the garment, the, the prayer cloth, the anointing oil, the holy water, those different things, the cross, in order to, for you to receive your healing. And there's too much focus on those objects or those individuals and not enough attention on Jesus the Christ, who is the source of the miracle and the healing. If you would just activate your faith, that's how you get in contact with the source. That's what's needed in order for you to connect with the source. Activate your faith and you can connect directly to Jesus Christ without those objects being uh, in between. No third party is needed. No object is needed. And also no individual is needed when you activate your faith. And so what we did is we started this lesson off uh, with a reflection and we briefly looked at the point of contact for our lesson, which was the hymn, the H-I-H-E-M, excuse me. And we asked questions like, what if? What if the woman had touched Jesus's ankle instead or his Achilles heel or his sandal, um, you know, or some other part of his garment? How different would this uh, story be preached or taught or um, be seen in our eyes? You know, would we be preaching about the Achilles heel and how it's the weakest point on the body, but it bears the most strength. And, you know, you just think about all the different revelations that you hear people have about the point of contact when the whole point of the message was that she activated her faith and she tapped into the source. It was Jesus who said that virtue left from me. It didn't come through the hymn. It came from Jesus Christ, who is the source. And so we got to keep our focus there. Um, we're reasoning now. That's where we are. We had three specific points. We've already covered point number one, point number two via the series with supporting scriptures. And where we are tonight, we're going to cover point number three. Um, give us your questions. Your so our main text. History, and they all have this account of the story with the woman with the issue of blood. And of course, Matthew gives us the shortest version. Uh, Mark gives us the most detailed and long version of it. And we've already gone through the historical context for um, the writers. We talked about who they are. the Apostle Paul and so forth. And so on tonight, I'm just, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, just reiterating that this is where the main text came from. And the, the main point that we took from the scripture, in her mind, the woman with the issue of blood said, if I may touch his clothes or his garment. Now the scripture says the hem of his garment. Um, but it was activated within her mind. She didn't say it aloud. But she said, if I could just touch his garment. So at that point, because the way she said it in her mind and activated her faith, she could have touched Jesus on any part of his clothing and would have received the healing that she needed from him because her faith was activated in that if I could touch his garment, I will receive my healing and I could be made whole. And then, of course, the other part that we highlighted was the fact where Jesus said, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Again, reminding us that Jesus Christ is the source. He was the source of the healing and the way that she connected to that source of healing was by activating her faith. So if you have some time and you're just joining us, you may want to go back and read those scriptures. So here were our three points. Number one, we said unequivocally that there is no power in the contact object or the individual, that even an individual who is a in them to be used 
for the upbuilding of his kingdom, for empowering of his people, for the healing of bodies, for the delivering of souls, setting free captive minds. This is why he gives us this power to do these things, but he is the source. And so without his anointing, without his power, then uh, we have no power of our own and neither does that contact object. It is your faith. When you say to yourself, I'm going to drink this blessed oil until God heals my body. It's your faith that activates um, that blessed oil as a point of contact between you and God. But there are some who say, I don't need any blessed oil. I'm just going to talk to God and he's going to hear my cry and he's going to heal me. And according to your faith, be it done unto you is what the scripture says. So if your faith is the kind where it says that you have to get to your pastor or your preacher or some individual has to lay hands on you in order for you to receive your healing, then according to your faith, it's going to be done that way unto you. We talked about number two already, the fact that faith is the conduit to connect to the source. So according to your faith, be it done unto you. And in this one, we use the example um, you know, of a phone or a computer or anything that needs to be recharged with. Prongs that it does you no good if you don't actually work your faith. You have. That is the example, the technical example that we talked through. We were talking about being connected to the source. You cannot get the power that you need something that um, will allow you to tap in. And so when you take that plug and you stick it in the wall, that's the tapping in to the power source that is on the other side. And so faith is that. It is that cord that you plug in. It is that condo. faith. So I think that pretty much brings us to being caught up. Here was our reflection. I uh, just wanted to remind you all about the difference between the biblical hymn of the garment and where it was located and how it's different from the hymn of a garment today. Um, but those of us who have experienced sewing, we know that the hymn in our day and time um, is where you take the bottom of the garment and you fold it up and then um, you either do the hem tape where you iron it down or you fold it up and then you sew it. And what it does is it keeps the edge of the cloth from unfolding or unraveling um, and it gives it a finished kind of edge look. But a hem back in biblical times um, was described in the book of Numbers chapter 15 verses 37 through 41 uh, when they talked about the kanaf. Um, and I gave you a couple of pictures of kanafs. You probably see them today. Um, a lot of ministers are going back to either taking a kanaf and laying it across the pulpit uh, when they get ready to preach the word. You'll see some of them lay it across their shoulders um, when they're preaching the word. I've even seen some lay it across. The uh, instructions that were given to God's children, um, and he gave them specific instructions as to how to sew those garments, how to make those garments. And so um, the hem of the garment did not necessarily um, reside at the base or the bottom of a garment, like how we think of it today. Um, this could have been the mid in Jesus's mid-back, um, as, as shown in the picture down at the bottom, because of how the kanaf is made, and depending on how um, that garment was swinging on his body. It could have been higher than his feet. You know, we hear people preach and I mean, I've heard some really good messages about how she reached down and got on her knees and she pressed through the crowd. Um, that has, I mean, it sounds really good, but it has no biblical, um, basis for it. There's no scripture that says she got on her knees. There, there was a press because it was crowded, but there was nothing that says she got on her knees and, and crawled through. And then, you know, you imagine your, that she's, when she's hitting the hem of his garment, that she's down at his feet. Um, that we are scripturally sound and that we're teaching it in accordance to the way that it was written and for also for the time that it was written in. 
Also during biblical time, the hem of the garment could have been the flowing skirt. Uh, you knew that they wear multiple layers. And so it could have been the swinging skirt or the train that came out from the border of the garment. And it also could have been the fringe. Um, it could have been those tassels or that fringe part that was hanging from the kanaf that she touched because that would have been considered the edge of the garment as well. And so uh, we already talked a little bit about the Achilles heel and how that message would have been different um, if she had actually touched. At the hem of his garment, depending on which gospel you read, um, and that virtue left out of him. So uh, these scriptures supported point number one, which said that there is no power in the contact object or the individuals, that Jesus Christ is the power. Jesus Christ is the anointing. Jesus Christ is the H-I-M, the capital H, the capital I, the capital M. He is the power source, and we're directing all of our attention back to him, that even when healing is done, whether it's done through a contact object or an individual, it is God who has done the miracle. And um, just to remind you again, even in the scriptures, the disciples never gave uh, credit to themselves for the healing that was wrought. They always said things like Acts 15. But the miracles and the wonders that God wrought, the special things that God did in Acts 19 and 11 by the hands of Paul. In other words, God got the credit for performing the miracle um, which is very contrary to what we do today. Um, we give man the credit and it's time that we redirect the attention back to where it needs to be, which is back to God. Then we talked about that conduit. We used the example and according to your faith, be it done unto you. So like I said, again, if your faith says that you have to have that object, then Assessor. Okay, thank you so much for joining. Linda Lee, I hope you can hear me now. I, I'm just now seeing your message. And hopefully um, those, the rest of you who are online can actually hear uh, what is going on. If not, let me know and uh, we'll see if we can't fix that. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, so when we talked about the conduit, um, these were the scriptures that we used. Uh, number one, you need to understand that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, is the evidence of things not seen. So we talked about that. We talked about the prayer of faith. Um, this is where we brought in the scripture that instruct us to call for the elders of the church. But you need to be mindful that even when the scripture instructs you to call for the elders of the church, it is the prayer of faith that shall save the sick, and it is the Lord that shall raise him up. So again, don't be so focused on individuals. It's the prayer of faith that shall save the sick, and it is the Lord that shall raise them up. We've got to put the glory back where it belongs. Put it Provide your healing or be that conduit for that unction, that anointing, for, for laying hands on you, for providing that prayer of faith. It is the Lord. And we want to give him the glory, the honor, and the praise for the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that he is rotting right now, that he is doing right now in this generation among and through his people. But we don't want to take the credit for it. We want to make sure that we give all the glory unto God. So then that brings us now to our final part of this uh, scripture here and this lesson, which is point number three, reaching and pleasing God requires faith. So you need to get your Bibles. This is where we're going to dig in for tonight. And when we get done with this, this is our final point for us to talk through on tonight. And so let's talk about it. We talked about the H-E-M 
and the H-I-M, the him and the him. So uh, let's look at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 6. We know this is a very familiar text of scripture. Hebrews 11, verse 6. I'm just looking to see if I want to go a little further back. Yeah, why not? Let's just start at verse 1 and read through. Verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders of do a by it he being dead yet speaketh verse 5 by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Then verse six says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. That is an act of faith right there all by itself. For you to come to God, you must first believe that he is. And not only that he is, that he exists, but that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that diligently seek him. And so Reaching and pleasing God to please him if you don't believe that he is who he says he is. So first you must believe, number one, that he is, that he exists. And then number two, there's an and, a comma and an and, which means that the two things go together. They're not separated, but there's a requirement, and it's a dual requirement. One, that you believe that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, you believe that he exists, and then you believe the things that he says about himself. And in believing what he says about himself, you understand his character. And based on his character, he's saying, I'm a rewarder of them that diligently seek me. If you seek my face, you will find me. If, if you knock, I will answer. And so you got to believe both things. You got to believe one, that God exists. And then two, you got to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so when you're seeking God for healing, deliverance, miracles, signs, and wonders in this day and in this hour, you must first believe that he still is doing it. I know he is. in our cars and if you're in a place where you're not seeing the signs the miracles and the wonders of God you need to get in a place where it's happening <laughs> because he is not silent in this season we are not serving a dead God he is alive he is well he is sitting on the throne he is in full control of everything that is going on and our God is active in this season he is speaking very loudly and very clearly and if you want to hear what God is saying, all you've got to do is tap in, use your faith to tap in. According to the scripture, it is impossible for us to please him. So reaching him requires to activate our faith. So what is Mark the 11 chapter? To get connected to the source. So let's look at Mark 11, verse 20 through 24. The scripture reads, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw a fig tree. Remember, and saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. Four words, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, anyone having faith in God, shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt. Another clause being added there, that and. So you've got have faith in God, 
Then you got whosoever, that's any of us uh, that would have faith in God, speak to a mountain and say to that mountain, the be thou removed, cast into the sea, and not doubt. The Bible says that an unstable, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Speak one thing out of our mouth uh, because then we're contrary. And you know, God is not only looking at uh, listening to what we're saying verbally out of our mouths, but He's also looking at what we're saying in our hearts. And so it's real important that when you begin to activate your faith, that there is no doubt in your heart. No doubt in your heart. That's what verse 23 is letting us know. You can say to the mountain, Speaking to the mountain is one thing. It's a whole nother thing to make sure that there is no doubt in your heart that he is going to perform that. It says, and shall not doubt in his heart. That's another requirement, an and. Don't doubt it in your heart. But shall believe that those things which he shall, which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he saith. And so a lot of times we find um, the failure it is not in what we've spoken. The failure comes in uh, us having doubt in our heart. And so we need to check our hearts that as we're standing on the word of God and practicing and activating our faith, that there is no doubt in our hearts that that which we have spoken is going to come to pass. And 24 says, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them again. Pray, you desire it, pray for it, believe that you're going to receive it, and then you will have it. And uh, be cautious. We've got this warning here about pleasing God, reaching God, uh, not having doubt in your heart. And so check your hearts. Let us check our hearts and make sure that our hearts are in the right place when we're going before God to ask him for anything. Our final scripture comes from Matthew 21, verses 17 through 22. And the scripture reads, and Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever, and but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit, I'm sorry, grow on thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. In other words, Jesus spoke to it. And immediately it began to wither away. Verse 20 says, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, ver verily, I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not. Again, having faith in God, reaching God, pleasing God requires you to have faith. And there's that clause there. And so that means that we must be mindful that we do not have any doubt. The Mark, scripture from Mark told us not to have doubt in our heart. The scripture. Mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And then verse 22 says, and all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And so we have this particular text recorded in two gospels, um, recorded a little bit differently. Mark talked about the fact that it was Peter um, that was having this conversation with Jesus and uh, Matthew uh, makes it seem that it was happening with more than just one disciple. Um, but it's the same fig tree. Out. No doubt in your heart, no doubt in your mind, because there has to be alignment between what you're saying with your mouth and what you're believing in your heart. No doubt in your heart. Uh, when you want to reach and please God and activate your faith, that doubt can't be there, uh, which is why we're cautioned and warned about being a double minded man or a woman because a double-minded man or a woman is going to be unstable in all their ways. And it's difficult for you to reach God when your faith is wishy-washy or your faith is wavering.
homes, um, in our finances, and in every area and walk of our lives because God is active. Not silent. He is active and he's moving. He is speaking and he is still working miracles today. Okay, there goes my timer. So I'm down to one minute which actually worked out very well. So this concludes our study, the HIM, the H-E-M, and the H-I-M, which is Jesus the Christ. On next week, we're going to start a new series called Circumstantial. I am not going to give you any hints about where we're going with that. <laughs> Just know that uh, I've already received some downloads. <laughs> Um, my phone number is also listed there if you want to reach out to me as well thank you so much for joining us for 30 minutes on wins with god's precious one and lord willing we will talk with you on next week have a wonderful week um, may God meet you in your fast, in your prayer time, in your study time, in your meditation time with him uh, in the midst of this 40 days fast. If you have not started already, we started at midnight on last night. You are welcome to join us. You can start right now um, and join us. It's not too late uh, to get on this 40 days fast. Um, and may God honor your request in the midst of this time and in this season. God bless you and have a wonderful night.